I will start recording now. So welcome to this Take 20, a technical assistance curriculum for expanding sustainable school-based oral health programs in the Carolinas Dental Safety Net. Today's Take 20 will be led by Ama Riley. This Take 20 will, be, will highlight the process for developing and implementing a technical assistance curriculum, including partnerships, curriculum components, community-based environmental scans, grantees, and evaluation. Before I start, I would like to address a few housekeeping items. This presentation is being recorded and I will later be posting it on open uh, online community at communities.openoralhealth.org. I, have also, um, I will also add the link to the chat shortly. If you aren't familiar with this community, you should go to the link and request a login and gain access to all of OPEN's resources, policy alerts, and network-wide updates. Lastly, we please ask that you complete a post Take 30 survey, which I will also um, put in the chat. So currently I have you all muted, but if you have any questions throughout the presentation, um, if Ama allows, I guess we can come off mute, or if you'd like, we can um, save them till the end and we'll have a Q&A. So now I will turn it over to Ama Riley. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valerie. Can you guys see my screen? I'm having lots of technical difficulties over here. So we can see it. Can see it. Yes. We can see it. Okay. Thank you. I do not have access to my notes at this point. So y'all just bear with me and we're going to um, chat today about that technical assistance curriculum for expanding the sustainable school-based oral health programs in the Carolinas Dental Safety Net. And again, uh, my name is Ama Riley and I am a registered dental hygienist in the state of South Carolina, but I also have received my master's in public health from A.T. Steele University and am currently working on a doctorate of health sciences from Campbell University in North Carolina. Um, I began as a dental hygienist in a private practice and then moved on out into a public health world as a program coordinator for a school-based oral health program that was being built and designed um, in an FQHC in South Carolina and then took a little break and was a provider representative for the benefits administrator for South Carolina Medicaid, and then found my way over to the Medical University of South Carolina, where I serve in the College of Dental Medicine's Division of Population Oral Health as a technical assistance coach in providing this curriculum to um, nonprofit organizations across the Carolinas to expand these programs across um, the states. Let me see if I can advance. Here we go. So just a little introduction that you guys um, had seen when you registered that school-based oral health programs provide opportunities to address oral health inequities by providing convenient access points for care, specifically among rural communities. So um, putting school oral health care services in schools just makes a lot of sense since we know that our children are in school most of the time uh, to help eliminate those known barriers such as transportation and um, the inability of guardians and parents to take off of work. Currently, there are no published guidelines on school-based oral health program implementation. And so today we're gonna talk about how philanthropic, public, and academic organizations partnered to support rural dental safety net providers with designing comprehensive school-based oral health programs in North and South Carolina. School-based oral health programs, so what do we know about them? We know that they are essential to the dental safety net. We know that they expand access points to oral health care. They allow flex flexibility in care delivery. There are several different um, styles and modalities that include the portable equipment going into the school buildings or mobile equipment that is uh, on buses or trailers that sit outside and even fixed sites on school grounds or off school grounds with a transportation component. Um, we also know that with health policy alignment, these school-based oral health programs have an increased success rate 
and the lack of those published guidelines on development, implementation, and evaluation. Recognizing the need for the school-based oral health program expansion and the lack of those guidelines, some philanthropic partners got together and committed to a five-year plan. Um, the Duke Endowment, along with the Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina Foundation, and a little bit later, the Blue Cross Blue Shield South Carolina Foundation, um, came together and created this school-based oral health plan expansion initiative and partnered with academic institutions, the, specifically the Dental Colleges of Medical University of South Carolina and East Carolina University in North Carolina to help um, develop a set of guidelines um, to move forward this initiative to promote and um, create sustainable programs. Um, throughout the initiative, there were some other partnerships that formed, um, especially the ones with South Carolina and North Carolina Medicaid programs and the North Carolina Oral Health uh, Collaborative. And um, just a little side note that I'd love to share with you guys is that those partnerships, in addition to the advocacy efforts of the North Carolina Oral Health Collaborative, led to a policy change for dental hygienists in the state of North Carolina to allow those hygienists in certain public health settings to be able to um, serve patients and open access points to um, the restrictions and uh, limitations that had been previously imposed were lifted for um, certain settings. So that was a huge win and um, partly due to this initiative. So that was exciting and I just want to share that with you. But the um, partners, defined the initiative and program purpose as to standardize a vision for school-based oral health with goals to improve access to dental care for school-aged children, improve meaningful care outcomes, increase the number of children served, particularly those that did not have sources of routine dental care, and to proliferate programs that have viable, sustainable business plans. With, the, with that goal and those, um, I'm sorry, with that purpose and those goals in mind, a technical assistance curriculum was developed. Um, the curriculum component, specifically the evaluation component, was informed by a HRSA grant program in the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. Um, you can see the uh, study here for you. I would highly recommend anyone that wanted a little bit more information to go take a look at that study. It was very well done and provided a backbone for this particular initiative. As part of the technical assistance curriculum, a set of school-based oral health program recommendations were developed with uh, as a collaborative effort with um, national thought leaders and field experts. These recommendations were broken down into three different categories. So there were some recommendations for programs um, around the care plans, which include or which oral health services uh, will be provided that includes case management and education services, um, care delivery site choice and the type of modality, community engagement, partnerships for, that, were, that are essential for success and consent processes for care. Then our next category of recommendations were around business plans. So looking at optimal staffing models, staff training and development, your electronic health record software and becoming a, a portable um, mobile entity that's a little bit difficult sometimes with internet connections and um, printing and things like that. Billing strategies and financial productivity goal setting was also included in the business plans. And then our last category was impact assessment, assessment 
to talk about the recommendations around reporting data for performance and using storytelling of success for uh, the program success. Those um, recommendations ended up um, being broken all down into 15 different recommendations in those three categories we just looked at. They were nicely packaged and presented to um, grantees as they proceeded through a readiness and planning phase of a grant. And with those 15 school-based oral health program recommendations, we created 15 learning modules and those were um, broken down into four different domains. So we had all of the recommendations around operations as um, a set of learning modules, financial enabling services, which are the consent services and impact. Um, just a little bit of background for the technical assistance format. Those learning modules were um, developed as pre-recorded webinars uh, that were pushed through um, on a learning platform, on a shared platform that could be assessed by the grantees. They were developed, um, again, around those individual recommendations with um, best practices, to help inform and um, help with those organizations in building the plans for expansion or a brand new school-based oral health program. Part of the technical assistance, um, in addition to those learning modules, were corresponding worksheets that were designed that um, would assist in the, all of the individual steps and help the organizations capture their tentative and final plans. And also included in the technical assistance piece was uh, monthly calls or in-person visits with technical assistance coaches where the application of the module content was strategized. A little bit of the initiative design is helpful here to think about the technical assistance curriculum. Uh, the Duke Endowments had applications available for a readiness grant for nonprofit organizations, and if awarded, they would be funded for a six-month planning and readiness phase. This phase is where the grantees went through the technical assistance curriculum. Once that was completed over the six months, if they successfully completed all of the learning modules and planning steps, and they were ready for implementation of the program, they were um, able to apply for an implementation grant. If awarded, they would be funded for a two-year implementation phase, which then um, also required one year of additional reporting. In um, talking about the different recommendations and the learning modules. This is um, how they were broken down for the individual organizations that were plan in those planning stages. So these, um, we talked about the four domains. So this is the operations domain. And you can see that um, there are seven different learning modules with uh, corresponding learning objectives and all have uh, deliverables of the organizations to successfully complete and be in a position to move into implementing the plan. So as you see, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but um, the site selection, the learning objectives there were for the organizations to be able to describe steps necessary for a school site selection and commitment from the school district and to describe important components to be included in an MOA. And their grantee deliverables were a list of target schools that contact was made with relevant school officials and an MOA was obtained with the school sites or district. These operational um, modules included the site selection that I just talked about, also service scope, modality selection, um, their electronic health record and how to be portable, their optimal staffing models, staff development and program partnerships. 
these um, were placed in an order for their learning modules based on the order that made the most sense that they would need to make certain decisions. So for example, a site selection is first and service scope determining which services they're going to be providing at those sites. Those have to come early on to be able to inform future decisions that we'll see um, on this next slide, like the um, productivity goals to identify daily, weekly, monthly financial and production goals. So they would have to know which services they were providing and have that decision already made in order to move forward into this particular learning module and grantee deliverable. So in the financial domain, we have uh, setting the productivity goals and identifying performance data and how to collect that and billing strategies, and then enabling services were um, learning about consent processes and case management, education that's not um, solely limited to chair side education, and also community engagement. And then our last but not least my, um, domain was impact and learning how to use storytelling to capture um, the ability to share their program successes. During the planning and readiness phase, we encouraged programs, organizations to always use data to drive that planning and drive that readiness. So this is an example of a community-based environmental scan that was used to inform organizations on which county may be the in most need and maybe even which schools they would like to start with. And um, I think these are a little bit out of order. Let me skip ahead real quick. Um, another type of, um, if this is the evaluation piece, the data collection overview that I mentioned was informed by that HRSA study on one of those earlier slides. So these um, sought to measure the oral health, primary health integration, um, financial sustainability, and the delivery of services. So you can see the different uh, columns here for utilization service related data, the financial performance data, and expanded capacity or resources. And these are pieces of information that the organizations through that readiness and learned how to use to draw future decisions. And just to give a little bit of a um, update and a little bit more information for you guys, we are um, just currently entering with our fourth cohort into a readiness and planning stage. And we have three cohorts uh, that came before them that are currently in their implementation phase. So we are up to 37 organizations that have gone through or are currently going through the technical assistance curriculum piece. Um, this information, this TA technical assistance curriculum was published recently in the Maternal and Child Health Journal. I would love for you guys to go take a look at that. That does have some additional information, um, especially in how process evaluation was used for tracking the progression of the organizations and their programs um, and how these um, different pieces of the recommendations and curriculum was um, able to help them and inform organizations to build these sustainable models. And that was pretty much um, everything I had. I know that was kind of brief, but just kind of wanted to give you guys an overview and love to answer any questions that anyone has. So we, um, if you would like to come off mute, please do so. Or if you would like to write your question in the chat, um, go for it. <laughs> I, um, there was one question or one um, comment, if you could please provide the information on the, on finding the study. Um, if you want, you can send uh, me a link and I can also add that to um, open communities where we will be sharing the recording and slides as well. Uh, and I apologize if you answered this 
and I missed it. Um, but could you tell me, uh, I noticed that you um, said that people could apply for a grant at, uh, uh, when they reached a certain point. How much uh, could they apply for and, and to whom did they apply? Um, that's a great question. Thank you. They applied to the Duke Endowment. The funding um, came from, uh, depending on which state you were in, either the Duke Endowment funded the uh, majority of the implementation awards, but the uh, foundations um, in the North and South Carolina Blue Cross Blue Shields funded a lot of, or if not most of the um, readiness phases. So those applications all filtered through the Duke Endowment um, and the uh, readiness phase grants were around 60,000. Um, and that was over the six month to, to purchase any um, needed technology or training or software or um, a position, a grant manager for this. So they were, it was used in several different ways. And then the implementation funding, um, that was not, um, there wasn't a cap given. So grantees um, or applicants, I should say, were asked to submit their plans and, their, and what they um, assumed would be their costs for startup. And then there was conversations back and forth about um, grant funding amounts. Thank you. Could you also tell me what the average size of the staff for each of the applicants would be? The average size of what? Of their staff to actually um, provide these services. So it really differed um, among the applicants. We had some applicants that had been doing school-based oral health for um, several years that wanted and needed to expand into other areas. Um, of their service area for their FQHC or health department. And then we had some um, organizations or entities that were that had a dental component of their organization, but wanted to venture into school-based oral health for the first time. So I'll tell you that um, for the programs that were fairly new um, or, they, or are new going into those um, school-based oral health for the first time, they generally um, had a dentist, a dental hygienist and an assistant and possibly a coordinator that may have been shared between their fixed site and their um, mobile initiative. Um, there was, so there was one more question in the chat. Um, is this the final TA curriculum? Uh, is the, sorry, is the final TA curriculum posted somewhere online? The final TA curriculum is not posted online, but it is part of that um, technical assistance paper that was published in um, here in the Maternal and Child Health Journal. So I can send that to you, Valerie, as well, um, that link. And Ama, I also posted it in the chat as well. I can thank you, Dr. Dr. Nelson. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I will also be posting it in the, um, on, the, on the open communities post uh, with the recording and slides as well, if that's all right with you. Perfect. Um, so if there are any other questions, um, if not, this will be on open communities and the, also the slides. And thank you so much for um, presenting today. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Ama. And I just wanted to thank Ama for her time for sharing this um, as a part of the rural um, NRT for open. And we were great, very, very grateful to have her come and share some of these best practices and opportunities. And if okay with you, Ama, we can make sure that we include your email directly for if there's any other additional questions that might need, you know, a little bit more um, discussion. So thank you so much, Amy. I really appreciate it and everyone for joining in.
Yes, thank you so much for having me. I will also add that to open communities. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.